Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to the Tate Podcast. My name is Evan Forrester, and I'm here with Philip Mullins, the Senior Solutions Marketing Manager. Philip, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. Would you mind just telling everyone a little bit about who you are? Sure, sure, sure. So I'm focused on utilities. I have a, a, a background in supporting utilities. I've done that for maybe the past 10 or 15 years. Uh, I've been focused on smart grid in particular for at least eight of those 10 years. Um, and I've really been focused on communications and how do we create more and more opportunity for utilities to optimize capital investment in voice infrastructure, such as selecting DMR as a standard. And so, um, yeah, this is, this is my, uh, my little world that I live in, and it's a great place to be. We're at the cusp of real innovation here. Okay, great. So today we're going to be talking about DMR voice and data networks and how that can help utilities. And uh, just the first question for you, Philip. We talk about DMR being a voice and data network, and the big question is what are the advantages of that? Why would you want to have one network running both voice and data? There's really two different reasons. So the, the first reason is, is this way the systems are designed. So it's designed as a mission-critical voice system, and so it is built very tough, uh, has great resiliency, and then when you can utilize vo or data on top of that, you get that advantage inherently of a, a very resilient, mission-critical type design. And the second thing that's important is that it takes a lot of people to run a network of these types in terms of its complexity. There's a lot of service management responsibilities associated with that. And when you can reuse that staff for both, you save headcount. So your total cost of ownership is, is much lower than if you replicate networks and you have to have staff that support each. So there's a lot of synergies around running dual use over the same network. Okay, so there are other data and network options available, obviously, but DMR, because it is a mission-critical system, you know it's going to be more reliable. Right, exactly. Okay. Exactly. And what are some of the other data networks out there? Uh, there there's many, many, uh, both proprietary and standards-based. Most common, especially in the United States market, is WiMAX. Uh, based on IEEE 802.16D. Uh, so it's a fairly simple, similar to a Wi-Fi hotspot, but on a much larger scale. Um, and again, it is very capable. It's very much needed by the industry, uh, and they will utilize it. Mm. The, the real opportunity you get from DMR is that you can target where you use it. You right. can use it less. You could potentially avoid having a licensed spectrum and even acquiring that can be tough, but if you do, it's very expensive. And so this is a potential opportunity to allow you to target it, use a lesser design standard, use mm. unlicensed spectrum, and then have DMR as a backup to that link. Yeah. So that you, at a minimum, you can still reach it. Okay. Uh, there's also mesh networks, which is very common for the advanced metering environment. And again, those are, those are very capable technologies that can do the similar type things but if you think about it, it was purpose-built for metering. Uh, its entire design, the way vendors bid it into the systems, is very skinny. They're mm. trying to win the bid. And so they're not building it robustly. They're not attempting to manage performance. So right. they're going from one meter read a month to 96 meter reads a day. Mm. And so they size to that very appropriately but they don't really size to more functionality like distribution automation and some of the other SCADA type applications. So it's just, it's not built for that purpose. It right. can do some of those things and where it's easy and where it's inexpensive, uh, utilities will do it and they should do it. Yeah. But it's certainly not universal and it's not wide area. You'll never see mesh out in the rural environments. Mm. Um, and so, again, we're very complementary to other technologies, but I don't think that we'll displace them. I think that we'll just allow them to be targeted where you can optimize kind of your capital investments as well as kind of minimize your operating expenses through cellular, things like that. Okay. And, again, there's also the public domain, right, the public carrier networks, which are also very capable of doing many of these things. They're less likely to be used for control functionality. Right. They're far more susceptible to negative events, heavy, unexpected loading when there's a 
fire or whatever. And so if you think about it, again, the DMR environment is protected, designed and sized for that environment. Mm. Sized for the worst case scenario, right? For where you're rolling all the trucks at the same time to go address a problem. And so a lot more confidence in those systems to support control type functionality. Uh, but again, they all will coexist in the same utility. It's a matter of we bring a new alternative to our customers to really optimize where and how they use other technologies. Yeah, and that's what's great about the DMR is, I mean, or one of the things that's great, most utilities need a voice system. Absolutely. And so the fact that you can get a voice system that also has data and you always have that backup available to you, uh, or not even necessarily backup, it can be used as primary functionality right. for different things. So, right. And I think that it has a, a role in both, right? So it will yeah. be the primary in environments where it's more critical, where it's uh, more predictable in terms of latency and bandwidth requirements. Uh, and it's a very good backup to other environments where you might use what I would consider a lesser technology in terms of mission criticality and how well it can support that. But again, one of the alternatives utilities use today is satellite as a backup to some of like WiMAX or, or uh, cellular. And so this is an alternative to satellite, which can be very expensive, uh, fairly complex. And again, the data goes outside of your control mm. and your visibility. You can't really monitor a satellite network. No. Just like you can't monitor a cellular network. Our systems allow you to monitor the communication endpoint and correlate it to the grid environment so that when a device like a SCADA RTU fails to respond to a pole, you can go check the grid link terminal to make sure it's still there. And right. if it's there, you send an electric guy out. If it's not there, you send a communications guy out. But that difference saves them potentially one or two truck rolls. So it's, it, it, there's a very good economic case to be made yeah. for uh, using DMR. So you've already mentioned some of the uses for DMR data. Are there any other ways that utilities can enhance or improve their productivity using uh, DMR data? Yeah, the one way I would think about it is almost as an innovation platform, right? So there are lots of things they could potentially do. Uh, they could use it to unlock gates and fences at substations. They could use it to, um, to validate... Um, and act as kind of a second channel, uh, what, I, what I kind of view as a control plane for grid infrastructure. So you can separate common communications from this control plane type communication. So all the cheaper technologies could potentially do monitoring, mm -hmm. whereas DMR might do all the control functionality in response to that monitoring. Okay. So speaking of control, distribution automation is something Tate's really been pushing to do with DMR. What advantages are there to running distribution automation over a DMR network as opposed to other networks or fiber, or something to that effect? Yeah, well, first off, fiber is just exceptionally expensive. And, and while you will see a lot of fiber to substations, and over time you'll see more and more of that, you're not likely to see it traverse down feeders into some of the uh, various devices, reclosers, relays, capacitor banks, and controllers. Um, and so we, we, can posi or we are in position to provide that kind of functionality in a very nice, robust way on a mission-critical system that mm. has synergies around service management. So it's, it all comes back to the economic case of doing that. I will say that there are utilities who do automation over lots of different types of networks, but they don't get the synergy of a common voice and data network. And again, it allows us to give them the flexibility to decide when and where they will use different technologies. Distribution automation today still tends to be isolated from the end-to-end -end generation to meter energy value chain, if you will. Um, and so there is an opportunity to apply it at just the right places uh, without necessarily kind of displacing all other, all other uh, technologies. So it, it still provides a very good um, set of choices. It's really about giving our customers choices. Now you mentioned how it can work with other things. LTE is really here 
Uh, some people would say it's still coming. Some people would say it's already here. How do you see DMR working with LTE? So, and, and again, it, this is where there's a lot of differences across the globe. Um, the one thing that we have at least found up to this point is that there is not a lot of choices for industrial grade LTE. It's still kind of focused on the consumer commercial model. And therefore it has lots of additional infrastructure and complexity that frankly provide very little benefit to a utility. If they were gonna, so, and, and that's kind of a public, or I'm sorry, a private LTE environment that, sure. that applies to. In the public domain, it's being used already. And it's just like any other cellular modem. And it is true that it has substantially better functionality than what uh, 3G type technologies, GSM or CDMA has. But it is still public. You mm -hmm. still aren't able to integrate endpoint management of an LTE device with grid management. So when that RTU fails to respond, you're blind as to whether it's the communication system or the device itself. Um, and so it does have a role. It's certainly very common for workforce management, embedding LTE in laptops and tablets and trucks. Yep. And, and the utilities can't compete with that. They could never afford to build that level of robustness in a private broadband system. So uh, it's complementary. All these technologies are really complementary to one another. And it gives you yet another set of choices on how you might apply those. Right. Now, the data information that's required for things like distribution automation is quite small packets of info. Yes. So that's why we can use DMR, correct? Correct, correct. Yeah, and, and in fact, it's, it's interesting. There's, there's several different scenarios. Under kind of the more common centralized SCADA architecture, very little bandwidth requirements. Uh, even the capacity to hold information is relatively limited in the devices. So maybe one kilobit of data. And it's mm -hmm. really more about capturing any deviation from some set of, of uh, limits that you might set for voltage current. And there may be other, other type of uh, metrics that you would apply. But there are other devices that are on the system that do require greater bandwidth than what DMR could ever hope to provide. Uh, they have embedded two gig of storage, and they hold uh, files called oscillography files that give you several hundred samples per minute of a waveform and allow you to really analyze grid instability based on some historical record. And then some of these are being turned into real-time type streams coming out of the device. And again, mm -hmm. we're simply not capable to support that, but we don't have to, right? We can allow that to exist within an LTE type environment or a private broadband environment, and yet we can still act as that control mm -hmm. tool and isolate that. Right. Uh, I would say the other part of this that's really important is the cybersecurity threat to the public domain is tremendously greater than what you're going to see on a DMR network. Yeah. Especially a well implemented DMR environment that that controls access to the administration environment, things like that. Right. So if there were a disaster type event, whether it's natural or terrorist or something to that effect, the DMR network is going to be the most secure and it's still going to have that functionality for the key things. That base functionality, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Now, another question. Just in general, you know a lot about utility technology. What, what has you excited Several different things. So, so one is really the integration of renewables and this potential for microgrid and, and community-based generation. One of the things that's, that's very strange about the industry is that one, it's you know well over 130 years old. It's had really three different transformations. The first one was in the early 1900s when they went from a DC to AC system. So prior to that, they use alternators generated DC voltage and anything connected to it had to be within maybe a mile. Mm. And then in the, maybe the 20s, early 20s, they began to start experimenting with alternating current and developed transmission systems. And kind of what is still today what is called T and D, distribution and transmission, within, or transmission and distribution within the utility space. And then the third one, which is just now happening, is really this information-based 
control of systems uh, and extracting value from that. And so smart grid, if you will, is happening now. And it is really based on the value of information, this ability to do advanced analytics. Mm. And one of the things that's really interesting about how DMR and how grid links would play into all of this is our solution will prevent somebody from driving to a device and pulling out that 1K file. But that 1K file in the hands of an analytics engine will tell you the stress that wires have seen, the stresses that transformers have seen and other systems on the grid have seen. And you can start to predict when things might fail. And then if you can prevent an outage, that one prevention of an outage will pay for all the investments that led up to that. Mm. Because one outage event, especially one significant outage event, can run to the tens of millions of dollars. And that's not even accounting for the economic impact that has on businesses that lose power, families that lose power and have to go run, find a hotel or whatever else they may have to do. So there's a lot of unaccounted for loss Mm. economically that you can prevent. So I love this idea of resilient grids and being able to isolate faults. I love the idea of being able to support electric vehicles one day. And hopefully one day that will be the dominant vehicle, right? The way the grid is built today and has been for the last 130 years or more, you simply cannot have two-way energy flows. Uh, It would make everything break. And so the new smart grid is being designed to support that energy flow. My favorite piece of all this really is centered around the electric vehicle. So as an elect- if I owned an electric vehicle, which I don't, but I wouldn't mind, um, I would not only be able to charge it at home, but I'd be able to sell electricity back into the grid from my car battery to lower my bill, to help a utility address peak demand, and they could tap into my car, pull out some of that energy, and they could avoid doing things like running what's called a peaker station, which is exceptionally expensive to operate, or doing things that like unplanned energy trades. So when you're an energy trader buying bulk electric, you're doing it kind of in this common market environment, but as soon as you have to do it in an unplanned way, then it's cutthroat, then it's very expensive, and you don't get the same kind of basis points in terms of how you're... Um, being charged per kilowatt hour or megawatt hour. So yeah, there's a lot of opportunities associated with smart grid, electric vehicles, and all these other things. It's Mm -hmm. really quite fascinating. I think that the electric vehicle in the future will be your home UPS, right? So when the lights actually go out, maybe instead of selling it back to the utility, I can still run my, my house. Yeah. And it's fairly close to a common household in terms of its load, and it's power characteristic. Now it won't run your house endlessly. It might last for an hour, two hours, but that's better than nothing. Sure. And it's and it's interesting because it's a byproduct of a car I bought. It's yeah. not some home generation system I bought for backup right. power. And so the potential there is really just just stunning. Something you've mentioned a couple times that I think is just a really practical and tangible benefit of distribution automation and all the grid automation um, is preventing truck rollouts. So could you just talk about that a little bit more and, and how DMR uh, can help prevent, save money, but and prevent utilities from having to send out trucks? Right, yeah, and it's, it's really the most common return on investment that you're going to be able to claim for a DMR grid link type solution. Um, when there is an outage, and if it's a widespread outage, a utility will send all of its trucks out. And one group of people will go do assessments and look at, is there wire sparking somewhere, and should they take action there? And, and those people don't even have the equipment with them to actually take action. They're just doing assessments. They'll report that back in, and then another truck will roll. Right? If I could assess the damage remotely right. through grid links, then I could only send the right guy to the right place at the right time with the right tools. And the savings represented there is substantial. The typical truck roll in a grid operations environment is about $500. That's based on some some, uh, analysis done around center point energy and their smart grid deployment. 
Uh, there's other people out there like Duke who their entire grid automation program, 80% of the return on investment was truck rolls. Wow. So it's enormous part of this. And a lot of that is because the advanced analytics piece of this hasn't been implemented or it's not uniform today. But once you have the data and you can acquire that data without a truck roll, then you can start applying analytics to that. You can start to discover all kinds of interesting information around where I have weaknesses in the grid architecture and where I should beef up things, where um, where I am vulnerable to cascading failures. So if one transformer goes out, the next substation down the line would, would be damaged by that. Mm -hmm. So you're not only having a, a quicker and faster response time to problems, but you can actually start preventing Absolutely, problems. absolutely. And it's great, too, because it's so many benefits, I think, of technology. Sometimes people say, oh, well, in five years, you'll have this benefit, whereas this, it's you know, today, right. you can s start saving money on the even just gas prices alone of sending out trucks. Absolutely. You know, just right off the bat. Yeah, it, it, it's funny because it's not really framed as this green solution, right? Meant to be right. ecologically friendly. That's not mm. what motivates them, frankly. But it is a byproduct. It of is. It. Um, yeah, and, and, and again, it's it, it goes beyond just that initial truck roll. If you were to step back and you look historically at where I send trucks a lot, I can very selectively apply this to those places that cost me the most to support as a grid operator. And maybe that's rural. Or yep. maybe